because like I said, this chapter is pretty, pretty heavy, some heavy concepts in IR and, and, and mass spec. All right, chemistry 3101, we're getting into chapter 14, which is infrared spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. So you've probably noticed that we've skipped ahead 10 chapters, haven't we? Yeah, we've skipped ahead 10 chapters and you might be wondering, uh oh, do I need to know everything from chapter chapter five to chapter 13 in order to master chapter 14? Well, the answer is no, I wouldn't show you this chapter or teach you this chapter if I didn't think you could do it. But one thing you're gonna have to review uh, before you get into this chapter will be functional groups. So I'll write down here, functional, functional groups, things like ester, ketone, amide, amine, alkene, alkyne, those are gonna come up a lot, alcohols, those are gonna come up a lot. Um, and this chapter is kind of broken up into two parts. You'll notice that the first part deals with infrared or what we call IR spectroscopy. And spectroscopy is the study of the interaction of, or is it really just the interaction of matter and light? So we're gonna talk about all the properties of light that you would have learned in general chemistry one. And then the second part is something that would be new to you, mass spectrometry. So notice that these are two different words. And spectrometry is the interaction between energy and matter. So the first one is light and matter or electromagnetic radiation which is the fancy word for light. And then spectrometry would be energy and matter. All right, and something that you wanna remember from way back in your Gen Chem 1 days is when you started talking about light, you talked about how light had wave-like properties, but it also had particle-like properties, okay? And we're gonna be looking at both of those concepts this morning as well. So just a little review of light, okay? Tiny review of light says spectroscopy involves the interaction between matter and light. Okay, so matter and light, and remember the fancy word that we use for light is electromagnetic radiation. And you see that electromagnetic radiation or light is made up of two um, oscillating fields that, that are perpendicular to each other. One is an electric field and one is a magnetic field. You can see that they're oscillating with the same frequency and um, they also have the same wavelength. But anyhow, you can see the direction of the propagation of the light beam here. And you should know things like wavelength and amplitude and stuff like that. And those are things that you would have covered back in your general chemistry one days. Anyhow, so if you go back again to your general chemistry one, you would have looked at the concept that light, light can be thought of waves of energy or it can be thought of as packets of energy called photons. And an equation that you might remember when you looked at light in the form of a wave is um, the speed of light or C. So C is equal to wavelength times frequency. Give me a thumbs up if you remember seeing that formula. The speed of light, which is three times 10 to the power of eight meters per second is equal to, uh, there you go, is equal to frequency times wavelength. So um, yeah, so nothing really new there. I guess I could scribble it down here, maybe C, which is the speed of light. So maybe we'll put here C is equal to 3.00 times 10 to the power of eight meters per second and then we say c is equal to wavelength times frequency so wavelength we're going to report that in meters and then frequency if you remember is reciprocal seconds seconds to the minus one and so that gives us meters per second does anybody remember the other unit that we used for seconds to the minus one seconds to the minus one is also equal to what anybody remember that this would be back in your gen chem one or if you've studied physics, you might have seen this before, a reciprocal second or a second to the minus one. Okay, so a second to the minus one. Yes, thanks, Kiana. Exactly. A second to the minus one or one over a second and it's also equal to a hertz. All right, so frequency or hertz. So again, this is equal to this little symbol here, which is the mu symbol. All right, so let's get back to this whole idea of frequency. And we see here that the energy of each photon. So now we're thinking about light as a particle. Here we were talking about light as a wave, right? Speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency. Now, if we think about the energy of each photon and photons, uh, now again, we're thinking about uh, light as matter, okay? is directly proportional to its frequency. So we have this formula here, energy is equal to H times nu. Now remember that nu was our frequency or our hertz or our seconds to the minus one. And H, if you don't remember, H is Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds. So if we take joules times seconds, and then we multiply that by seconds to the minus one, we end up with joules, okay? So it says here 
that wavelength is also inversely proportional to energy. Well, we can just do a little bit of mathematics here and figure this out. Okay, let's take a look here. If we said that energy was equal to Planck's constant times nu, and then we also said that um, the speed of light is equal to wavelength times frequency. Well, we can rearrange this formula and solve for frequency, and we get that frequency is equal to the speed of light, come on, over wavelength. So now we can plug this term into here, and we get a new formula, which I'm going to write in blue here, which is E is equal to HC over lambda. So what's our kind of takeaway here? Okay, let me just clean this up a little bit. What's our kind of takeaway message here? Two things, okay? I'll circle them in green. Number one is that energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. What does that mean? It means the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, the longer the wavelength, the lower the energy. It's kind of counterintuitive, isn't it, right? You know, you might think, well, if the wavelength's really big, it should be really powerful. In fact, that's the opposite, right? A long wavelength is really low energy, but a short wavelength is very high energy, right? Because energy is inversely proportional to um, uh, wavelength. However, we see that energy from our formula back here, energy is directly proportional to frequency. And so if we have a high frequency, we have high energy. If we have a low frequency, we have low energy. And if you're looking at all these formulas and going, good gravy, I'm going to have to go back and take a look at this. You know what? I would say that would be completely normal. Okay. A lot of people have to go back and look at these formulas. All right. So let's move on to the next slide, which is nothing more than a review of the electromagnetic spectrum, which is the range of possible frequencies of light. There are many wavelengths of light that cannot be observed with your eyes. In fact, the vast majority of wavelengths of light cannot be detected with the human eye. And in fact, this scale that you see here, this is not the scale at all, okay? And you can see that actually the visible spectrum of light uh, makes up only a tiny part of the electromagnetic spectrum. In reality, it's much smaller than what it appears to be in this, um, in this, uh, in this scale here. So you need to know, you should have this memorized, that we go from microwaves, okay, and radio waves, which are the biggest waves, right? They have the biggest wavelength, right? Because we see that the wavelength is increasing in this direction. So, so radio waves have really, um, really big wavelengths, but they have a very, um, a very uh, uh, low frequency, right? So we have high frequency up here, and then we have a low frequency up here. And since we know that wavelength is inversely proportional to energy, remember that E is equal to HC over lambda, energy and wavelength are inversely proportional. So that means that radio waves and microwaves are going to be very low energy, energy. In fact, every single one of us has radio waves that are going through our bodies right now, right? We have cell phones and there's uh, cell phone towers everywhere. So we have all kinds of radio waves going through our bodies. Then from there, you go up to infrared. And of course, that's the, that's the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're going to be interested in in this chapter. So this is chapter 14. Then we go up to near IR. Then we go up to visible, which is between 400 and 700 nanometers. Then we go up to near ultraviolet, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma rays, right? Gamma rays have a really um, short frequency and they have a very, um, uh, or sorry, very high frequency and a very short wavelength, and so they are very dangerous, all right? But again, what we're interested in is going to be the interaction between matter molecules, organic molecules namely, and, um, and, uh, and light, and infrared light, and the information that we're going to get from this is going to be functional groups. So functional functional groups. So again, that's what we're going to be talking about a lot in this chapter. All right. Well, it says here that the infrared spectra goes from two micrometers to 50 micrometers. That, in fact, isn't really accurate. It's more like um, something like 2.5 to around 25, I would say. So it kind of cuts in here. Not that I'm going to test you on that or anything, but it's more like 2.5 to 25 micrometers, that would be a little bit more accurate. So it's just a narrow portion even of the infrared spectrum. Anyhow, so um, I'm going to talk about this more later, probably after our first break and when we get into wave number a little bit more. But let's go back to this whole idea 
of electromagnetic um, electromagnetic over here electromagnetic radiation okay so we were talking about what light is and all these different forms of light okay and if you're wondering well can the other forms of light can they interact with matter and give us some useful information the answer is absolutely so um, something that we're going to talk about in chapter 15 will be the interaction between interaction b the interaction between radio waves the radio waves in organic molecules and that is actually the most important form of spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy. But again, we save that for a couple of weeks. And why is this the most important? It's because it tells you about the arrangement of all the carbon and hydrogen atoms in the compound. So it actually gives you information about how all the atoms are connected together. But again, what we're going to focus on today is going to be the interaction between infrared light. Okay, so this is chapter 14 um, in matter. And what we're going to get the information we're going to get from that is going to be the information about functional groups. Is there a ketone in the compound? Is there an ester? Is there an aldehyde? Is there a carboxylic acid? Is there an alcohol? That kind of stuff. All right. So you're going to need to review your functional groups. I think I've already said that a few times. Well, let's talk about quantum behavior for a few minutes here. And if you're thinking, you know, I heard about quantum behavior in general chemistry one and I never really understood it perfectly. Um, let me see if I can explain it to you the simplest possible way I can. It says here that matter exhibits particle-like properties on the macroscopic scale. Matter appears to exhibit continuous behavior rather than quantum behavior. So if you're wondering, you know, what is continuous behavior, right? Continuous behavior versus quantum behavior. Continuous behavior, that would be what you're used to in your everyday life and me too, okay? That would be classical physics, continuous behavior, okay? This car tire here, that exhibits classical continuous behavior. So if I was to tell you, I want you to get this tire to spin at any speed. I want it to spin at 50 miles an hour. You'd say, no problem, Mr. Gill. I want it to spin at 51 miles an hour. I can do that too, Mr. Gill. I want it to spin at 51.23 miles per hour. Okay, have it your way. We can do that. All right, okay. And you can imagine, even if technically you want the, the tire to spin at 51.23334125.98 miles per hour. You're like, well, that's kind of ridiculous. But the idea is that you could do it. The tire could spin at any speed at all, okay? It says here nearly any rate, but technically it could spin at any rate. But what quantum behavior is, and this it's difficult for us to understand. I'll be the first guy to admit it. Uh, quantum behavior would mean something like this, would mean that the tire could only spin at 50 miles an hour, and again, this is just a, an example that I'm using, it's not reality, but let's imagine the tire could only spin at 50, 51, 52 miles per hour. It couldn't spin anywhere in between, and you're probably thinking, well, that's impossible. I would agree with you, it sounds impossible, but that's the way that matter behaves on the microscopic scale. So let's take a look here. On the molecular scale, um, molecules do exhibit quantum behavior. So molecules don't act like the tire, okay? They don't act like that. Um, and what we're talking about is not rotation of the molecule, but vibration of the molecule. Now, if you're going, what do you mean by vibration of a molecule, Mr. Dion? What does that even mean, okay? All it means, for now, we're just going to imagine a bond between two atoms, and we're going to imagine it stretching back and forth, okay? So let's just, I'll draw something out here since you can't see me. Let's imagine you have a carbon-hydrogen bond. Sometimes it's short, and then other times it's long, right? It's kind of stretching back and forth, like a spring, okay? So imagine a spring, okay? You could even kind of, I'm being silly now, but you could connect them by a spring or something like that. But the idea is that it's going back and forth. We call that vibration. And, and every once in a while, I get students that are like, well, that's not vibrating. Well, that's stretching. It is, it is stretching, but stretching is a form of vibration, if you can believe it or not in chemistry, okay? So the idea is this, is let's say the spring is vibrating or stretching back and forth at this kind of low energy. Bang, 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 bang. Right, you have to have that sound effect in there. The idea is that it can start stretching or vibrating at a faster rate, bang, 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 right back and forth. But the idea is, is it can never be in between here. And again, if you're going, that's not, the, how is that possible? Again, I didn't say it was easy to understand, but that's a fact of life, okay? We're talking about quantum mechanics. So vibrations can only exist at certain, um, with certain frequencies, 
And since we know that energy is equal to H times frequency, if it can only stretch at certain frequencies, that means it can only stretch at certain energies. Give me a thumbs up if you're with me on this, even like 60% of the way. Only certain energy levels are accessible for stretching of the bond. It could be a carbon hydrogen bond. It could be a carbon oxygen bond. Cool. All right. Good. All right. So again, it can't be anywhere in between. And I, again, I'll be the first guy to admit it's crazy. I don't understand it or it doesn't seem to make sense to us, you know, um, since we deal with classical mechanics all day. If you grab a spring, you know, you can vibrate. If you grab a slinky, you can make it stretch with any frequency you want. But bonds in a molecule, they don't work that way. All right. So let's move forward here. So it says here that for electrons and covalent bonds, the vibrational levels are separated by gaps, right? They're quantized and they can only access certain energy levels. But check this out. This is where it gets really interesting. When a photon of light, what kind of light are we talking about in chapter 14? Infrared light, right? We said 2.5 to 25 micrometers. When a photon of light strikes a molecule with an exact amount of energy needed, when it gives you that exact amount of energy, the light gets absorbed and you have a vibrational excitation. I can't help myself, let me just back up, okay? So let's say you have a molecule that's vibrating at this energy level. You hit it with a photon of light, okay? H nu, and it's exactly equal to this delta E here, this energy gap, it's gonna go from here to here. Now what I just drew here, that's a heresy, right? That arrow, because I drew it connecting the two lines, but it goes from, this level up to this level, okay? It's got to hit it with that exact frequency of energy or that exact difference in energy, and it has a vibrational excitation. You're like, okay, well, what do you do? It starts vibrating faster. We're good for it, okay? Well, here's where it gets useful for us as chemists, okay? So different types of bonds absorb different IR energies. Aha, this is where it starts to get interesting because now we can take maybe a carbon-oxygen bond or a carbon hydrogen bond, right? Different types of bonds. I don't know, carbon oxygen bond, maybe a single carbon oxygen bond, maybe a double carbon oxygen bond, maybe a carbon nitrogen bond or a, a double bond or maybe a, a, an alkyne, okay? The idea is that now, since uh, we have different differences, <laughs> different, um, I guess I'm using it correctly, different differences in energy, uh, between the vibrational levels of these different types of bonds, now we can differentiate different types of bonds using infrared light. So what happens to that energy that gets absorbed? Well, it gets released from the molecule in the form of heat. Okay, so it's given off as heat. But again, in terms of, you know, what we should be interested in as chemists is this statement right here. Different types of bonds absorb different amounts of infra infrared energy, and that's going to be really useful for us in a few seconds here. So let's go back to this whole concept of stretching and bending and vibrating and all this good stuff here, okay? So remember that I kept saying vibrating, okay? And you're probably thinking, well, if I have my car running and I put my hands on the hood of the car, then it feels like the car is vibrating or something like that. But again, in chemistry, in organic chemistry, we use vibrating. We say it, it could be a bond stretching or it could be a bond bending, okay? So there's all kinds of different things that bonds can do. What we are going to focus on in Chemistry 3101 is this, okay? I'm gonna write over here, Chemistry 3101. We're gonna talk 90, greater than 90% of the time about stretching vibrations, okay? Stretching, bonds stretching like they're on a spring, okay? It even says here at the bottom, this chapter is gonna focus mainly on stretching, that's chemistry 3101. If you took a higher level class on spectroscopy, it'll get into um, all these different bending vibrations. And what I'll try to do, if I can remember after class, is post a little link on Wikipedia. If you, I'm, I'm dead serious, Wikipedia. If you go on Wikipedia and type in infrared spectroscopy, there's a really great animation of all the different types of stretching and bending that you can have. There's a couple that are shown here. It's really hard for me to act them out, um, since I'm giving this lecture remotely, but maybe during the break, I'll, I'll show you, I'll turn the camera on and I'll just try to act them out and not be too, too much, make too much of a fool of myself. But again, if you go on Wikipedia and you type in infrared spectroscopy, there's a really fantastic animation of all the different types 
of stretching and scissoring and twisting and bending and rocking and wagging. These are different names of, of vibrations. But again, what we're interested in in this class is mostly going to be stretching, which is a type of vibration. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you're with me on that. Everybody with me on the idea of stretching, which is a type of vibration. Cool, because that's what we're going to be interested in this class. <clears throat> Let me show you a little more information. I'm going to skip this part with the night vision goggles and the detection of cancer because I'm not going to ask you any questions about that. I want to show you something here. Uh, if we have two different types of bonds, check this out. We've got a carbon hydrogen bond. Are those ubiquitous in organic compounds or what? Right? You're like, well, come on, Mr. Dion. There's a carbon hydrogen bond in every molecule you ever showed me. Okay. That's all chapter four was about. Yeah, you're right. Okay. What about carbon oxygen bonds? We find those in all kinds of places. We find them in esters, carboxylic acids, alcohols, ethers, right? So it says here the energy necessary to cause the vibration depends on the type of bond. I already explained this to you, but here's a specific example. You can see the energy gap, the difference in energy for the vibrational levels in a carbon hydrogen bond is bigger than the one in a carbon oxygen bond, right? So what that means is, and this is kind of getting ahead a little bit, but if energy is equal to H mu or energy is directly proportional to frequency, what does that mean? If we have <clears throat> a, um, a bond that has a higher energy gap, a bigger energy gap, it's going to absorb at a higher frequency. OK, and if you've already read the chapter and watched my videos, you're like, well, frequency isn't even plotted on um, in an IR spectrum. You're 100 percent correct. We use something called wave number. And we're going to get into that a little bit. But the main idea is understanding the concept here, right? Let's say you have a carbon oxygen bond that's vibrating with this level of energy. It absorbs a photon of light. And then all of a sudden it starts vibrating at a higher energy level. All right. I think I've kind of repeated myself quite a bit about these um, concepts. So let's talk about what an infrared spectrophotometer looks like. Spectrophotometer is nothing more than a fancy word for the instrument that we use to run an infrared spectrum. We have two of them in the undergraduate lab at UCCS. And I'm gonna tell you right now, when I was a student, the old spectrophotometers, I really am dating myself here and I really sound like the, a grandpa or something like back in my day. Well, when I was a student, the spectrophotometers were ho horrible because you had to prepare the samples on sodium chloride plates, which is really miserable. Nowadays, we don't have to make any kind of KBR pellets or sodium chloride pellets. The new spectrometers, like the ones we have in our lab, you can literally just put the sample on the instrument, just straight out of your flask onto the instrument and get a beautiful IR spectrum. So the new IR spectrophotometers are just beautiful. But what they do is what they do is they take the frequencies absorbed by the sample and uh, they plot those on a graph, which you can see here on the computer. And again, what does that tell you about? It tells you about the types of bonds which can tell you the type of functional group that's present in a compound. And so if you haven't understood, okay, I'll repeat it again. Um, you know, what's the whole purpose behind running an IR? It's to determine, you know, is your molecule a carboxylic acid? Is it an alcohol? Is it an aldehyde? Is it an alkyne, an alkene, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't tell us the complete identity of the molecule. No, no, no. But it gives us some very good information about the identity of a molecule, wouldn't it? All right. So if you're wondering, what does an IR spectrum look like? Here you go. Okay, here's an IR spectrum. I remember I had a student one time who said, it looks like an EKG. You know, I've been shadowing in the hospital. It looks like an EKG. Well, it's got nothing to do with an EKG. Okay, It's got nothing to do with that. You can see uh, that this absorption spectrum plots a couple of things. It plots percent transmittance. Okay, that's down here. As a fun function of frequency. Okay, as a function of frequency. And if you're like saying, Mr. Dion, that doesn't say frequency, that says wave number. What the hell is that? Well, I'm going to get into that in just a, a few minutes here. So we'll get into that in uh, in just a bit here. I'm just looking at my notes here, just see funny things I've written here. Anyhow, so we call these peaks in the spectrum, we call these absorption bands. So let me use my red pen here, and I'll try to show you what the absorption bands are. So we have... An absorption band here. So we've got a big broad absorption here. That's at around, I don't know. So we go 3,000, 3,100, 3,200, 3,300, 3,400. So this is maybe, you know, so you go to the lowest point here. Um, and that would be around, what did I say it was? Around 3,400. We'll just write 3,400, something like that. And you can see the units we use are centimeters to the minus one. So centimeters 
to the minus one, something like that. So let me just um, address something for you here quickly. And I had some notes written here, just bear with me as I find them. Um, yeah, so let me just address this whole thing of wave number. I think I have a little thing here about wave number here. So can I just explain this to you quickly? Um, wave number, it says here, is equal to frequency over the speed of light. Well, there's actually a much simpler form of this equation. Let me just show you quickly. So instead of plotting frequency on the x-axis, if you will, down here, we use this thing called wave number, which is centimeters to the minus one. I'm not going to go over the derivation. I think it's included in my videos. So we have, we have um, wave number is equal to frequency over the speed of light. And then we know um, that uh, uh, if we have, um, anyhow, I'll just leave it like that. I'll, I'm trying to make things more complicated than they need to be. Anyhow, you can also determine that wave number is equal to one over wavelength. And if you remember, I said that the wavelength in infrared spectroscopy was equal to 2.5 micrometers to 25 micrometers. So if we convert that into reciprocal centimeters, we get um, we get um, uh, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 centimeters um, to 25 times 10 to the negative 4 centimeters. I'm kind of running out of space on here. And so if we use the formula, I'll write it down here in black, wave number is equal to 1 over wavelength. If you take 1 over 2.5 times 10 to the negative 4 centimeters, what you end up with is 4,000. So we get 4,000 centimeters to the minus 1. So that gives you this value up here. If you do 1 over 25 times 10 to the minus 4 centimeters, you get 400 centimeters to the minus 1. So that gives you this value over here. So again, you see this value here and you see this value up at the top. So there you go. So if we have a shorter wavelength, we have higher energy. So up at this end of the spectrum, where we have the highest wave number, we have high frequency. So we'll put here um, high frequency, high, high energy. And we'll put here um, shorter wavelength, short wavelength. And it would be the exact opposite down here. We have low frequency and then we have um, low energy and then we're going to have long wavelength okay but the industry standard what we use as organic chemists is wave number or reciprocal centimeters or centimeters to the minus one so that's the scale that we use if you go on youtube or google or wikipedia anywhere you go all organic chemists use wave number or centimeters to the minus one so give me a thumbs up if you follow me on the idea of wave number just where it comes from okay and again this is the formula that is just much more simple than than using this formula over here i don't know even know why we need would need to use that there's no real need to use that you can use the formula that i have in the red circle and it will always give you the right wave numbers so the idea is that the the stronger the bond is or the maybe i should say since we haven't gotten into bond strength, if you were to compare these two bonds, right, the carbon hydrogen bond and the carbon oxygen bond, since this one has a higher energy gap, it's gonna have a higher, this would have a higher wave number, okay? And then this one would have a lower wave number. All right, just comparing two bonds, and we'll get into the comparison of bonds a little bit more later. So if we go back here again, you can see that we have, you know, we have a signal something like this, like I said, around 3,400. Then we have another absorbance here. We have some here, here, here. And if you're wondering, do I have to be able to interpret every single one of those little peaks there? The answer is absolutely not. Absolutely not. What you need to do is you need to be able to train your eye to look at the spectrum and say, well, this is what's pertinent for me. You know, these are the important signals. These signals, not so important. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. So what are the things you're gonna look for? In the spectrum, the three things that you're going to look for are the wave number. So, what's the actual wave number? Okay. The second thing is you're, you're going to look for is the intensity. Okay. So that's going to be how much, you know, how great is the absorbance really? And then the last thing is the shape. Is the signal broad or is it sharp? And I'm going to get into those things in a little bit here. So I'm just going to put here, you know, is it broad? 
or sharp, or is it somewhere in between the two? So we'll cover all three of these um, concepts. So first let's get into wave number, okay? So remember our wave number is mu with a little hat or a little line on top of it like that, and it's reported in centimeters to the minus one. Okay, we said that our range was from 4,000 centimeters to the minus one to 400 centimeters to the minus one in the infrared spectrum. That's our range of wave numbers. Now, where does that wave number come from? Here's the formula for wave number here. And you can see that wave number is tied to two characteristics of bonds. One is bond strength, okay, bond strength. And if you're wondering, do I have to have a bunch of bond strengths memorized? No, I'll give you some very simple um, uh, information that you can use to, 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 you know, to give you a relationship between wave number and different types of bonds. And the last one, or the second one, is the mass difference between the atoms. And as long as you have access to a periodic table, which you always do, you can determine the difference, you know, and you can determine the mass of, of an atom, right? Even if you don't have it memorized. So if you're wondering, do I need a calculator on my quiz to do a bunch of, you know, calculations based on this formula? The answer is absolutely not. All you need to be able to do is understand the rationale of this formula. And there's two main points that are shown at the bottom here. So the formula is this. Wave number is equal to 1 over 2 times pi times the speed of light, right? These are all constants. These are never going to change. So this whole term here is a constant. So we can kind of ignore this term in a way. The second part of the formula is F over reduced mass to the power of a half or the square root. So if you're wondering, what's F? F is the force constant, which is the bond strength. If you've studied physics before and you've looked at Hooke's law, you probably would have covered the concept of force constant. So if wave number, okay, is proportional to um, the force constant, what does that tell you? It tells you that the stronger a bond is, the higher the stretching frequency. That's it. The second thing is reduced mass. And you see that reduced mass is equal to M1 times M2. So these are the two masses in your bond. So let's say you have M1 and M2, okay? And then divided by the sum of M1 plus M2. Now, if you can't do the mental math, okay, you can see that hopefully you see that reduced mass is inversely proportional to our wave number, all right? And so what's the idea here is that the smaller the atoms, the higher the stretching frequency or the higher the wave number, right? The heavier the atoms, the lower the stretching frequency or the lower the wave number. Let me review this for you one more time. The main points that you need to know from the formula are this. The stronger that a bond is, the higher the wave number. Okay? When it says higher stretching frequency, remember that wave number and frequency are related to each other. They're proportional to each other. Um, and then the smaller the atoms, the higher the stretching frequency, okay? Those are the main two points. And if you're still not 100% sure on these, you're gonna figure it out once we start looking at examples where we have different types of bonds and different types of atoms in those bonds. So trust me, you will be able to connect the dots on these two concepts. So let's look at some very specific examples which will help the whole thing crystallize in your mind. It says here the trends and stretching frequency of given bonds can be rationalized based on, again, bond strength, okay, and mass difference, which is, again, tied to our reduced mass. And I gave you the formula for reduced mass right here. So let's take a look at two examples here. And number one, you see that we're going from a carbon-hydrogen bond to a carbon-deuterium bond to a carbon-oxygen bond to a carbon-chlorine bond. So what's happening here? is that we see that the mass of the second atom is getting heavier and heavier and heavier and heavier. Are you with me on that? They keep getting heavier and heavier, the atoms, as we go from hydrogen to deuterium to oxygen to chlorine. So what's the idea? That means that our reduced mass is getting larger and larger and larger. Well, reduced mass is in the denominator of the equation. So the bigger the atoms get, the lower the wave number, right? Again, I'll just write it here. Wave number is inversely proportional to the reduced mass. So give me a thumbs up if you follow me on point number one. The heavier the atom in the bond, the lower the wave number. All right, the next one is related to bond strength. And we said that wave number 
is directly proportional to bond strength or the force constant, which is the same thing as bond strength. So hopefully you remember from way back in chapter one, okay, that a triple bond is stronger than a double bond, which is stronger than a single bond. And so therefore, um, a carbon nitrogen triple bond should absorb at a higher wave number or higher, higher frequency than a carbon nitrogen double bond or a single bond. So, and if you're wondering, would it be the same rationale for a carbon carbon triple bond, double bond and single bond? Absolutely, okay? So give me a thumbs up if you're with me on the second concept. So bond strength, yeah, anybody with me? All right, awesome. So if you understand those two concepts, you're gonna understand this little kind of um, shortened version of, you know, absorption frequencies. It says the wave number formula and empirical observations allow us to designate regions as representing specific types of bonds. And so if you look at an infrared spectrum, right? Remember, it goes from 4,000 uh, reciprocal centimeters to 400 reciprocal centimeters. Here was high, high, I'll put here high energy. And so what was high energy tied to? It was tied to um, uh, stronger bonds. So stronger bonds, okay. And down here was lower energy, low energy. It was tied to um, weaker bonds, weaker, oops, weaker bonds. So let's take a look at a specific example here. Look, if we go from a carbon-carbon triple bond to a double bond to a single bond, what do we see? They go from a high wave number, right, high energy, to a low wave number, lower energy, where we have a weaker bond. You see the exact same thing is true for a carbon, nitrogen, triple, double, and single bond. As we go from the triple bond, which is stronger than the double, which is stronger than the single, the wave number keeps dropping as we go from stronger bonds to weaker bonds. Then we also said that um, weaker bonds were gonna be associated with heavier masses, okay? So the uh, heavier masses of atoms. Well, it's kind of difficult to compare that or to, to investigate that on this particular, um, this. But one thing I do want to point out is that I've had students raise their hand in class before and say, I thought you said that if we have, if we go back here, I thought you said that if we have a, um, uh, a reduced mass, okay, if this, the mass gets heavier, we get a, um, a um, lower wave number, right? And if we have a smaller mass, we have a higher wave number. Well, you see that the mass of a hydrogen atom is so small, it's such a light mass, that the hydrogen atoms, whenever you have any atom bound to a hydrogen, it's going to have a really high, um, it's going to have a really high wave number. Even if the X, even if it's an oxygen or a nitrogen, um, it doesn't matter because the hydrogen is such a low molar mass, it has a molar mass of one, that anything that has a bond to a hydrogen is going to have a really high wave number, okay? So that's kind of a, a, a different one, but again, it's based on the idea that hydrogen has such a small molar mass. So um, what we designate the area above 1500 rec reciprocal centimeters, we call that the diagnostic region. So anything above 1500 reciprocal centimeters, we call this the diagnostic region here. And anything below that, so anything below that, we call that the fingerprint region, okay? And we're gonna spend probably 90% of our time, or we'll put here greater than 90% of our time in the diagnostic region. The fingerprint region, we don't actually look at it a whole lot in our class, and there's a good reason for that. Um, it's because the fingerprint region is really, really difficult to analyze. The only time we would use the fingerprint region is if we have two compounds that have very similar diagnostic regions. We can differentiate between the two of them using the fingerprint region, just like if you have two people who are, you know, who look very similar, maybe you can't tell them apart. I don't know, that's maybe not the best example, but you can use their fingerprints to tell them apart, right? So let me give you a, an example that should clear that up. It says here, because you have the same types of covalent bonds in this compound here, this is called 2-butanol, and the name isn't important because we haven't studied the nomenclature of alcohols. However, we have um, looked at alcohols as a functional group, and this one you would call this 2-propanol. So 2-propanol. Um, so let's see here. It says, 
Because these have the same types of covalent bonds, the infrared spectra for 2-butanol and 2-propanol are virtually identical. So check this out. If you take a ruler, okay, if I take my ruler here and I draw a line at 1,500 reciprocal centimeters, if I do it here, and then if I do the same thing here, okay, you notice that the diagnostic region of the two of these is almost identical. Right? It's very difficult to tell. Look, this part and this part looks almost the same. You even have this part is it's not identical, but it's not that far apart. Okay, so they look very similar. However, if you look at the or the fingerprint region, you look at here and here, it's completely different. Very, very different fingerprint regions. And so that's when the fingerprint region would be useful. Somebody asked a question, would I use, would that be used to tell a halo alkanes apart in the diagnostic region you mean above 3000 reciprocal centimeters? Generally, no, because they're not organic molecules. So we would only, and they don't have a functional group. So we wouldn't run an infrared spectrum on a halo alkane. I suppose that technically you could, but we would never do that since it's not a, since it's not an organic molecule. All right, let's move on from there. And let's take a look at some bonds uh, strengths uh, between um, carbon hydrogen bonds of different hybridizations, right? We know that carbon hydrogen bonds are pretty much ubiquitous in organic chemistry. They're in every, every compound we look at has some kind of carbon hydrogen bond in it, doesn't it? Well, you can see that as we go from a carbon hydrogen bond that it involves an sp3 hybridized carbon to an sp2 to an sp, what happens is the wave number increases, right? We have a higher wave number here. Now, the book seems to me like it takes a long time to explain this concept. I can explain it to you really quickly. If you remember way back in chapter one, when we looked at hybridization, we said that an sp orbital is smaller. This is a smaller orbital than an sp2, and that's smaller than an sp3. And we said that the smaller the orbital was, the shorter the bond was, right? Because the carbon and the hydrogen had to get closer to each other to have orbital overlap. Well, what does that mean? If the orbitals are getting closer together, it means the bonds are going to be stronger. So the sp hybridized carbon hydrogen bond is going to be the strongest of the bonds. And then this one is going to be the weakest. And so just by looking around 3000 reciprocal centimeters, if we have signals below that around 2900, that's going to tell us we have sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching. If we have a stretch around 3,100, it tells us you have sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching, like maybe from an alkene or even an aromatic. And then finally, if you have a terminal alkyne, which means an alkyne where one of the carbons in the triple bond has a bond to hydrogen, then you're going to have a stretch around 3,300 reciprocal centimeters. Now, if you're wondering, well, what would that look like, Mr. Dion? Could you show me a picture of that? Sure, sure, absolutely. Take a look here. So you can see the red vertical lines on all three of these spectra are drawn at exactly 3,000 reciprocal centimeters. So we see that the alkane that only has sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching has a bunch of signals kind of below 3,000 reciprocal centimeters. Well, that makes sense because in an alkane, we have all only sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching. And if you're wondering, well, why do you have so many of them? Why do you have so many different stretches? It's because they're going to have maybe slightly differing um, bond strengths, okay? That would be the main thing, okay? So you're going to have a whole bunch of them. Um, so varying bond strengths a little bit. So you're going to see a little bit of, you know, difference there. Um, if you have an alkene, then you're going to have sp2 hybridized um, carbon hydrogen stretching that comes at around 3,100 reciprocal centimeters. But even in an alkene, you're still going to have that ubiquitous sp3 hybridized <coughs> carbon hydrogen stretching. And then in alkyne, we're going to have sp hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching at around 3,300 reciprocal centimeters, but we're always going to have a bunch of sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen bonds, okay? Those are present in almost every compound we look at, unless you look at something that's only aromatic, okay? That would be the only exception to that rule. Most of the compounds that we see are going to have some kind of carbon hydrogen uh, or sp3 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching, all right? So if you're wondering, well, every time I have an alkene, um, shouldn't I see a signal here at 3100? The answer is maybe not. If I have an alkyne, should I always see a signal here at 3300? The answer is maybe not. And if you're wondering, if you're scratching your head and saying, well, why would that be? It's a good question, okay? 
But here are some possibilities. What if you have a tetra substituted alkene like this? You have an R group everywhere here, and none of the R groups are hydrogen. Well, in that case, you still have an alkene, you still have a carbon carbon double bond, but you have no sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching. So just because you don't see the evidence of an alkene, of an sp2 hybridized carbon hydrogen stretch, it doesn't mean you don't have an alkene. And if you're thinking, oh, darn, you know, how do I figure that out? Well, we have other ways, okay? Um, if you don't see a signal at 3,300 reciprocal centimeters, it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have an alkyne. Because if you have an alkyne that has R groups on both of the sp hybridized um, carbons, then you'd have no uh, sp hybridized carbon hydrogen stretching. So we can't prove something by a negative. Right, we can't prove just because it's not there doesn't mean it doesn't exist in the spectrum. So just something to keep in mind. Now, another thing, you guys remember what, what was the topic that we covered in chapter two? We covered the topic of resonance mostly. Okay, that's resonance. That's what took up most of our time, and so resonance should be pretty fresh in our brains at this point. And if you look at a carbon oxygen double bond. Remember, we call this a carbonyl. Whenever you have a carbon oxygen double bond, we call that a carbonyl. And we see carbonyls in all kinds of functional groups like aldehydes, ketones, esters, carboxylic acids, amides, acid chlorides, acid anhydrides, etc. So, um, you know, how can resonance affect a wave number? How can it affect our stretching? Well, check this out. It says here, if you have a ketone, it's just giving you a fact here that the absorption for a ketone occurs around 17, 20 reciprocal centimeters. However, if we have a conjugated ketone, what happens to the wave number is it gets lower. So that means it's going to be lower energy. Well, why would it be lower energy? Well, do you remember the con connection between bond strength and wave number? So we said that the stronger the bond, the higher the wave number. And so the reason why this carbonyl has a higher stretching frequency or a higher wave number is because it's a stronger bond, stronger C double O bond or a stronger carbonyl bond. And this one here is a weaker carbonyl bond. So weaker carbonyl bond. And if you're wondering why would it be weaker? Well, it's based on resonance, resonance, right? Both of these double bonds have some single bond character but the one in the conjugated ketone has more single bond character. If you're wondering, well, why would that be, Mr. Dion? Well, check this out. Look, if we draw the two resonance forms of the ketone, we have one where it has single bond character, right? If you remember the patterns, we said when you have a double bond between two atoms of differing electronegativity, you can draw this resonance form so that you can see that we have a single bond here. Whereas in the conjugated ketone, we have one two resonance forms where we have a single bond drawn between uh, the oxygen and the carbon. And therefore, the conjugated ketone carbonyl has more single bond character. And if it has more single bond character, it means it's a weaker bond, and therefore it's going to absorb at a lower frequency or a lower wave number. Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. I know I haven't asked you a lot of questions yet. It's kind of hard when I'm introducing the top topic of uh, infrared spectroscopy, but don't worry, we're going to get into plenty of practice problems in the near future. All right, so what's the take home message? Is that if you compare a carbonyl of a ketone versus a conjugated ketone, a ketone that's conjugated is going to absorb at a lower frequency. And the same thing would apply to an ester. If you had an ester carbonyl, it absorbs around 14, 1740, excuse me. But if it's conjugated, it's going to absorb at a lower wave number, right? Because that carbonyl has more single bond character. All right, the exact same rationale. Why don't we take a short break before we get into the concept of intensity? Uh, not because I don't want to lecture on intensity right away, but I know that I've covered quite a bit of content already. So when we come back, we'll get into intensity and shape, and then we'll start looking at actually you know, how would you analyze an infrared spectrum? And we'll try to um, uh, we'll try to look at a few examples. So somebody asked me, is this trend true for all conjugated molecules? No, no, it wouldn't be true for a benzene. Right. So if you had an aromatic ring like this, you have three double bonds. Right. But if you draw the resonance form of that. Right. It doesn't change anything. OK. So it doesn't mean that just because you have resonance, just because you have conjugation, 
that some of these bonds are going to be weaker than others, right? It would be specific cases like these. All right. Well, with that in mind, let's take a little break and then we're going to come back and we'll get into intensity and shape. And then after that, we'll try looking at a few practice problems uh, to, to see if we can clear up any, uh, any confusion about anything in, 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 the, in IR. Because the best way to master this concept, like most concepts in organic chemistry, I would say like all the concepts in organic chemistry, is just to practice it. So again, we'll take a short break and we'll come back and we'll, we'll finish up IR and then we'll look at some sample problems. Thank you. 